Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this old video, we are off to Louisiana, down to Baton Rouge, to be specific. And and you know what? After like researching into this story, it's kind of made my bucket list of places I do not want to go. This is about as brutal a story and character that I've that I've come across. He makes you know, the, the list of top ten evil scary bastards. So look forward to that. Uh, please subscribe to see new videos every week. Now, let's give it a go. So you know what, there's a lot in this one, so I guess we kind of gotta go back to the very, very beginning. And that is the 24th of June, 1962, when Yvonne and Norman Gillis, they welcomed a son, Sean Vincent Gillis, into the world. This was in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And what do we know about Baton Rouge? Well, if one of my stories takes place there, you won't be learning much good about it. But hey, it's the capital of the state, and its name means Red Stick, which could very much be taken the wrong way. Now, Normandy didn't really, didn't really stick around too long. He left his son with Yvonne to be raised by her and her parents, which probably a good thing. He was like a bit of a, you know, a bit of, yeah, he was, well, I mean, one thing he did when he was there before he kind of out of the 5000s was held a gun to his baby Sean's, to Sean's head. So it's probably a good thing Norman didn't stick around too long. A severe alcoholic with numerous mental health issues, which led him to frequently have breaks from reality. I mean, his son isn't going to be much better. Alrighty then. Yvonne tried her best, struggling between a full-time job at a local TV station and being a mother to Sean. She really did adore Sean and did everything she could to provide a good life for him. See, despite her best attempts at trying to, you know, positively you know, guide Sean, even at 10 years old, he was able to bully in the neighborhood. Um, he's real kind of like little shit is probably the best way to put it. Things won't go up from here. See, being a bully was something that would follow Sean throughout his entire life. And you know, as a kid, him and his two best friends, they, they loved watching and reenacting satanic rituals, which on one hand is like, Hell yeah. on the other hand, it's like, it's probably not a good thing. I tried to kill my cousin once to feel her breasts up. How old were you? Oh, we were about 12, 13. What about funeral homes? Uh, funeral homes. This will go back to the childhood. I spent a lot of time at my grandmother at a funeral home right across the street. And then my cousin, I mean, we would do morbid things like sleep in the coffins. A lot of people can't believe that, but we do it. Regardless of his dark tendencies, it wasn't until shortly before he would turn 18 years old, in 1980, that Sean had his first official run-in with the law. Minor stuff, but you know, uh, you got the, got the gold snowball. After high school, Sean went directly into the workforce, and he didn't have any kind of plans of what he wanted to do for his life, so he ended up working at a 7-Eleven, but working? No, it wasn't really for him, it wasn't really kind of his cup of tea, so essentially over the next few months he would bounce around Various jobs, working in retail, convenience stores, and, and you know, faffing about, faffing about for the best part. See, Sean really enjoyed spending time in front of his, you know, clackety clackety computer. And you know, back then, the internet was kind of just newly born. It was only starting to take off on it. Pretty much only stuff for government officials, Star Wars, and Star Trek lovers, and good old porn. What more? Do you need? Well, see, Sean, he kind of like, whoop, fell down a bit of a rabbit hole as uh, what he liked to kind of have a goo at became, you know, increasingly more and more extreme, disturbing, and Sean really kind of found what, you know, kind of set his burner off, and it was blood. Lots and lots of blood. So pretty soon you got some good old illegal territory, and as I said, yeah, what got his blood flowing was literally blood. You ever heard of Walter Mitty? Secret Life of Walter Mitty. That's the life I have been leading for about the past eight years. Secret Life of Walter Mitty. Secret Life of Sean Gillis. Jekyll and Hyde. By the time I was 30 something, I was well into it. There was no point of return. One thing helped, then another thing helped. No. Sean spent much of the next decade, until his early 30s, squirreled away in his bedroom next to his computer screen. But in 1994, Sean's life changed when he was introduced to a woman named Terry Lemoyne, and the two began dating. 
The relationship had almost not happened at all, as after their first date, the two got in a heated argument, which ended with Terry slapping him across the face. What happened then? Sort of funny. So after taking a shot to the kisser, Sean began to cry. Terry took pity on him and promised, you know, uh, she would never be violent again and fine, I'll go at another date, would you just stop crying? Yeah, I mean, it worked. So kind of sort of things went well for a bit. I mean, it's, it's a relationship. It started with a slap to the face, so... But soon Terry became concerned with Sean's growing obsession with, um, you know, said internet. Sean began to spend his evenings, while Terry was at work, cruising around town for prostitutes and watching women. Obviously, Terry had no idea about any of it. And then what started as this kind of shitty behaviour soon escalated beyond a sane person's comprehension. On March 21st, 1994, the floodgates burst open and poured out onto 81-year-old Anne Bryan. She was a stranger, and his intention had been to sexually assault the frail and vulnerable 81-year-old woman. But when Anne screamed for help, he instantly changed his intentions and he cut her throat. He then proceeded to stab her close to 50 times. Anne had simply left her door unlocked at the assisted living facility, and the shocking murder of Anne Bryan absolutely rocked the Baton Rouge area. You can make all the jokes you want about how he's the nerdiest looking guy ever, and how that moustache should not be left around children, and guess what? You'd be right. Shortly after he brutally murdered Anne Bryan, Sean and Terry, they moved in together, this was in 1995, and he wouldn't, in fact, uh, kill again for another five years. Five years is like a pretty long cooling off period for how violent it was, but, um, Sean will make up for it, so. Between January 4th, 1999 to February 26th, 2004, Sean went into full-on serial killer mode, committing another seven brutal murders. The five-year reign of terror started with 29-year-old Katrin Ann Hall. Sean had once again begun cruising the streets of Baton Rouge. Whether consciously or not, he was stalking the crowds for another victim. Just like Anne, Brian Katrin Hall had no prior connection to Gillis. They'd never even crossed paths before. Katrin's body was later found dumped in a construction site and you know, he'd lured her into his car with the old, you know, offer of business. Business being murder. Just like with Anne, he brutally and repeatedly stabbed her 16 times while she was alive, another 20 after she was dead. Then, he treated himself, he had a little, he had a little treat. He took her, he took her eyelids, that's, he, he chopped off her eyelids in the back pocket. He then posed her body at that construction site near a sign that read, Dead End, which he, he probably was laughing all the way home about. Let's, let's get back to Calvin. How did that account begin? Had you ever been with Catherine before? Have you seen Catherine before? Just a chance encounter? Ships in the night. How long did you drive with her in the week? Um, tell me could be more than two hours and two minutes. Driving to the end of the world. Anymore, you help us clear. It, it can't hurt you. It cannot possibly hurt you anymore. The world is wonderful. It's just good. Now. Well, Sean wasn't exactly a mastermind criminal. He left plenty of DNA evidence behind, including like there was a pubic hair found right right beside her mouth, which people then led to believe, oh, he abused her after she was dead. There was DNA under her fingernails as then she had, she had fought him off, but they had nothing on file to match it to. Sean wasn't on their files at all yet, so they had his DNA, but nothing to say. Who is he? Sean's next victim was 52-year-old Hardy Schmidt. Sean had spotted Hardy while she was out jogging and begun stalking her. Then, roughly three weeks later, he saw her out having another jog again. This time he got in his car. He knocked her off the road, hitting her. She went flying into a ditch. Sean then got out. She was screaming on the ground, my back, my back. As you can imagine, Sean simply walked over to her and said, lady, your back is the least of your problems now. 
He fastened the zip tie suffocatingly tight around her neck, assaulted her, let her die, and threw her into the trunk of his car. Sean's fourth victim was 36-year-old Joyce Williams. Sean had picked her up working the streets in Scotlandville, and her body was later found when hunters stumbled across her remains. Next came 52-year-old Lillian Robson killed in January 2000, which was right around the time Joyce Williams' body was found. Objectification is exactly how I look at what it. You I call my weapon that sometimes, the objectifier. Because it would turn them from a woman to the object that I would then deal with. I'm yeah. talking about manipulating dead bodies. It's an interesting term you used. That's exactly the way I looked at it. And would it surprise you that the control of another being's limbs is a part of it? Okay. Now, despite having several very brutal, high-profile murders, which kind of had a very similar MO, none of them were actually linked at this point. The victims were all kind of varied. Some were sex workers, some were, some were not sex workers. So even the FBI profilers had a hard time trying to match, getting the red, red string out, right, and trying to match them all together. Sean's sixth victim was another sex worker named Marilyn Nevels, 38, and that was in late October 2000. The only one that I had any physical because she broke away and was walking across the lot and there was a car coming. It was kind of like, you know, well, whatever I can grab. So, what you saying? There was a piece, there was a pipe on the ground. Not even a pipe, there was like a steel rod. Kind of like we bar, but smoother. I just picked it up, smack, 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 until she quit fighting. Sean, by this time, had found his little M.O., his little, you know, his little routine that worked really well. He picked her up, drove her off, put his, a bead to shit out of her, put a zip tie around her neck, suffocated her to death, did shit with her body. She was cut, sliced, gouged, and her body was found on Halloween. So you have all of these brutal murders, really, really graphic stuff. We are all in the same area, relatively close. See, the problem was that the police were really kind of shitting themselves about was that there was actually another serial killer active in the area at the same time, Derek Todd Lee. Pace was found stabbed to death in his Charlotte Avenue home. She had just moved from Stanford Avenue. The 22-year-old lived just three doors down from Nurse Green. The 41-year-old was found strangled in her home eight months before Pace's murder. He had murdered at least seven women and had a very similar MO to Sean. So things were very scary at this time around the bayous. Sean remained in the shadows and actually began keeping tabs on his competitor, Lee. He didn't know Lee's identity at first, just that there was another serial killer out there, and he used the internet to follow articles and reports about the latest killing of the man the press dubbed the Baton Rouge serial killer, leading to Sean Vincent Gillis's name of the other Baton Rouge serial killer. There's just so many, you need, you need to have an other one. Later, when both arrested and captured on Sean's computer, they would find a folder DTL, which means Derek Toddley. Sorry, I was thinking of something else. So not only was Sean playing like a cat and mouse game with the police, he was playing with another serial killer too. I wonder if they crossed paths, just both out there murdering him at the same time, you know, hell yeah. Gillis would return to killing on October 9th, 2003, with the brutal murder of 45-year-old Johnny Mae Williams. However, what made her different is that, unlike all the other previous victims, Sean actually knew her. He was friends with her for like 10 years before he killed her, which is very rare for serial killers to murder people they're close with. Serial killers will usually only go after strangers or people they only kind of sort of know. But it didn't stop Sean. He did the same, picked her up in his car, drove her out to a rural spot, Suffocated her, stabbed the shit out of her, left her there. Yeah, I know right from wrong as well as you do. I know you do. But there are certain times when it fuzzes out. And it's really not that I don't know it anymore. It's like, it doesn't matter anymore. I this is know. my universe. It's my like God there. I am God. At one point I could control it. It's, it's beyond my control at the moment. I'm a homicidal maniac. 
I don't mean to be. Less than five months after killing Williams, Sean committed his eighth and final murder. Another sex worker, this time a stranger to him, named Donna Bennett Johnston. Johnston was 43 years old on February 26th, 2004, when Gillis ran into her in the street. She was very drunk when he met her, so getting her into his car was, was not really a problem, and then, once again, rural location out in the bayous. Unfortunately, you do know the rest. This time he strangled Johnston to death using an electrical cable he twisted around her neck. Once she was dead, he used a knife to slash both of Johnston's breasts and cut off her left nipple. He then gouged a tattoo from her right thigh and cut her left arm off at the elbow. Then, after removing her left arm, he took it with him and, um, you know, he wanted it to use as a... Yeah. He would later confess to detectives about Donna that he, he tried a little cannibalism, just, just, a, just a smidge, just a smidge. Um, but he said he didn't like it. Didn't like it. He said he, human fat was disgusting and he couldn't understand why others would do it. I don't think you need to try human to have that same thought. Pictures. Of the leg, you know, and I literally held and stretched the skin. Like I said, I'm trying to figure out what the hell this was a tattoo of. So after making the initial incision in the leg, I just cut a box around it. Then I find out how much human fat sticks to the back of skin. Okay, because getting it off of there was easier thought of than done. And at that point, you know, I look at it, finger it, play with it, you know, lick it. Um, even tasted the fat. This was where I tried a little cannibalism. Okay, um, human fat does not taste good. I don't advise it. I, I don't see how anything would survive off of it. Um, Two months later, authorities were able to match a tire print left at the scene where Johnston's body was found, matching it to Gillis's white Chevrolet Cavalier. Now, there was a number of people in the Baton Rouge area that drove Chevy Cavaliers, so the police went to every single one they could track down. Sean Gillis was number 26 on that list, and he voluntarily gave the police his DNA. Another thing which pops up from time to time with serial killers is a desire to be caught. Maybe that's why he gave it voluntarily. He must have known that it would eventually be traced to the other victims. And that, that tire print was the break they needed. They got him into custody, and then once he was in custody, DNA, my friend. And then they were like, oh shit. They had no idea when they actually arrested him for Don and Johnson's murder, that he would, his DNA would show up being matched to a shitload of other murders. So that must have been a, quite a surprise, but a good one, I think. Do you know why we're talking? We're talking because you had some tire tracks that possibly came from my car there. And from those tracks, it appears she was unloaded from that vehicle and thrown into that canal. She was not unloaded from my vehicle. When investigators searched Gillis' home, they found a bonanza of evidence, including the photographs he'd taken of bodies. On the computers, detectives discovered several files and folders created by Gillis, including one folder named Best of Snuff, Beheadings and Hangings, and one file titled Russian Necrophilia. So yeah, Gillis was pretty fucked. And that was even before they put him in the interview room and he, you know, gave him a cup of coffee and said, listen, what's the crack? Yapped away. You couldn't shut him up. You could not shut Sean Vincent Gillis up. Like so. The town will be as interesting as Charlie Vincent. Well, I'll leave that to the experts. At what point did, uh, did these women start to piss you off? Well, at what point did these women start to piss you off? Do you believe me if I say no point? Sure, I believe you. I believe you can get done. I don't think you're a straight shooter. I'm just comfortable with him. Is the word monster coming to Pardon? Is the word monster coming to mind? 
we discussed any of this with you? No. Yeah. As soon as I told him, yeah. I fought them. Okay. I mean, there's there's just so long you can fight something. Okay. Before it's just overwhelming. It's like it's like the cookie jar again. I'll use that analogy. You're looking at it. You know you just can't go into the cookie jar. You've been told don't go into the cookie jar. You probably won't go into the cookie jar if you're a good kid. Yeah. Which I was, literally was. A sick kid, obviously, but good. And in this instance, sooner or later, the hand goes into the cookie jar. It just the, the, it just overwhelms you after a while. The whole time you're tempted. Um, a lot of the times I was tempted, but nothing until then. That I just lost control of it. No lawyer, no pleading to fifth for sicko Sean. Nope. Once he popped, he literally could not stop. They could not shut him up. He would just go on and on and on. And, and as long as, you know, he was incriminating himself, the police weren't going to stop him. I was methodical in the way that I would get my bed. I was methodical in a lot of things. But when it came down to the actual, it was Helter Skelter. I mean, was, was there any kind of plan that you had worked out in your mind? Well, this one, really, I'm going to say, as far as, as to the actual, but as far as doing, yeah. killing, that was pretty much, it was, uh, the, as far as the any of the ritualistic acts, as y'all put it, as it's defined, there was nothing, uh, nothing meticulous like that. I mean, literally, it was pretty much slash, slash, don't gonna forget. Later, Sean wrote in a letter to a friend. I don't know what the hell is wrong with me. I was in a real bad place. I was pure evil that night. He's referring to the night he killed Donna Johnston, his final victim. No love. No compassion, no faith, no mercy, no hope. In all, Sean faced charges in seven of his eight murders. Officially, William Robinson's murder is still being investigated, even though it's everybody's full sure that it was Sean Gillis. Sean actually pled not guilty, and he tried to file motions to suppress his earlier confession and the validity of the DNA swab. Both were denied, and Sean was forced to change his plea. He narrowly avoided the death penalty when the jury were deadlocked on the decision, and Sean remains in protective segregation at Louisiana Penitentiary, also known as Angola. Sean's live-in girlfriend, by the way, convenience store manager Terry Lemoyne, she had no idea over the years and years they were together that he was secretly a serial killer. She once or twice had suspicions that something was up, but she simply thought he was having an affair. One time she even got in his car and smelled something foul. He said that he had hit an animal. All the while, there was a dead body in the trunk. Now she would say up until the day the police kicked in her door to arrest Sean, she couldn't believe, you know, he was a serial killer. After all, when they first met and she slapped him, he started to cry so she couldn't comprehend him ever being violent towards women. How wrong she was. She continued to live in the house they shared in Baton Rouge, until recently enough, though every Halloween, the house would be vandalized. She then moved to Alabama. Now, unbelievably, Derek Toddley wasn't Sean's only competitor. There was another man adding to the death toll of women in Baton Rouge at the very same time as both Gillis and Lee, Jeffrey Lee Guillory. Between the tree killers, they are taught to have killed 36 women in the Baton Rouge area over a 12 year period. And that is what makes Baton Rouge the serial killer capital of America. So, congratulations! Thank you so much for watching. It means, it means so much to me. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video. I mean, I don't know if enjoy is the right word, but you know what I mean. Um, here, listen, as, as always, you know, if you'd like to see extra videos, early videos, all that, please check out the That Chapter Patreon for two bucks a month to get up. All that kind of stuff. I'm on Twitter and Instagram and you know the rest. But until, you know, the next video, which will be up in uh, a couple of days, please take care of each other and, and yourselves. Because I love you. My go.